Hello, I'm Amanda B. Johnson, and you're watching Dash Detailed. As was promised in last week's Evolution preview video, today I'm sitting down with Dash lead developer Evan Duffield to talk Evolution details, and what's more, get an update on the status of Dash's next software version, 12.1. Sit back and relax. Here he is. Evan, how are you today? Ah, I'm doing wonderful, thank you. Good. Well, thanks for joining me. And I have to say, uh, this is a first kind of interview for me in that I did not have some questions in mind and seek you out and say, Evan, will you please come and answer these questions in an interview? But rather, you told me you have some things in mind and that you have some information you would care to share. And so with that sort of reversal going on, I'm just going to leave it to you to guide us through. OK, perfect. Yeah, so um, I, this, this time was a little bit different. Uh, when I was in Argentina uh, talking to random people, I started finding myself being able to describe evolution a lot better. And um, just from the, the conversations I was having, I figured out that uh, these people were really excited about what, what we were doing in a way that I hadn't really thought of. And so um, I just I, I wanted to, I guess, give the same pitch to the community of, of what we're building and of, of what, what I kind of discovered it, it means to me. And so um, the slides that you had, had shown, uh, I was just going to go through those and kind of uh, talk about what, what product we're building and why we're building it the way we're building. Perfect. And so um, the, the first thing is this be your own online bank. We, we can't use that slogan, but it's, it's going to be something like that. We, so what we're, we're, we're aiming to do is to be the Wells Fargo of decentralized systems. We, we want to create something that, you know, people are used to using that, Anyone that has any experience with, you know, the legacy banking um, institutions and how those work, they they could just move on over, and it would look just like that to them. And so, um, you know, to to get that sort of of ease of use, you need usernames and you need passwords, and so that's where this registration screen comes from. And this is all on the back end, just a uh, completely tied to our decentralized API. So, so um, we're gonna make a decoupled uh, GUI from the actual API so that any new developer can come on board and re-implement all of the, the ways these things look or act even. Okay. And, then we and, I'll have... quick, and I'll quickly just insert there, Evan, just for anybody who may not know, uh, a GUI is short for a GUI, which is a graphical user interface. So basically the stuff on the screen that the end user sees and is like clicking around in. Okay. Um, and then of course the decentralized API, as Evan also mentioned, is I don't know how many lines of code, but is basically a piece of code that anybody will be able to use to launch either an evolution wallet on the web or an evolution wallet on mobile without needing to run the entire Dash blockchain and, and do all of those things. Yeah, it, exactly. So um, the, the DAPI to, I, I guess it's, it's two different parts. There's the, the front facing SDK part. And if you're familiar with um, something like Stripe, they have an excellent API. And it's object oriented. So when, when you use Stripe and you set up um, a new client, you actually set up a customer and then you set up a subscription for them. And then with these APIs, you, you set up the, the schema, the, the database entries and everything on the Stripe side, right? And so what we're, what we're doing is creating something like really similar to that, except instead of having like the centralized repository of client information, we figured out a way to um, make these generic storage objects that then we, we store on this relational database that's built on Dash Drive. So is it pretty easy for somebody to uh, start up uh, 
like a Stripe account or whatever, basically, is that what you're saying? And Stripe is like a credit card processor, right? Yeah, so Stripe is like, um, it's like PayPal. Uh, you, you can sign up as a business and then you can provide services on the internet. And when, when you go to bill the, the client, you use one of these services. So in this case, it's Stripe. And they have this just excellent API where you can hook into it and you just drop these like little snippets of code into your web app. And that's, that's all that it takes for like a screen to pop up and ask you for your credit card information or ask you for your, your name and address and that, that type of information. And so um, when I say like, we're, we're building like the simplicity into it, I, I'm like, I, I mean, we're, we're building something like you would build in the legacy world, except we're decoupling all of the, the complexity of, of building and maintaining a system like this from, from using it. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I can move on to the, the next screen, which was the login screen. Yeah. So the, the idea here is that um, when, you, when you log in, you can log into your mobile device or you could log in on the internet. And in either case, you're just using your username and password. And then you see all of the same information. So um, as you get in, you would see the My Account screen. Um, and like that's, that's where you would see your public account, your savings account, oh, and private. So you, you can also have you know, completely a, anonymous funds. You can use it and it would work exactly like Bitcoin if you wanted to, completely um, transparent on the ledger side. Okay. Or you could move money into the savings account, just just like you were doing in a bank, and it would allocate it into masternode shares, mm -hmm. and that's that's where that that whole part comes in. So before we get into the very exciting aspect of how more about how masternode shares will work via savings accounts, I wanted to know personally. Um, okay, so if private coins uh, live in the private account. So does that mean that obviously all payments through evolution will not automatically be private sent, but rather all payments going to and coming from just the private account will automatically be private sent? Is that right? Um, yeah, pretty much. So like, let's say you have a private account and I have a, a public account and you give me an address in your private account and um, I've been buying like socks online stuff and I, so at, like everything that I did from that private, that public account, you can completely see, see what happened, you know, mm -hmm. and then I send you my sock money mm -hmm. um, and, and then you get it into your private account. The first thing that happens is it mixes. So all of my sock history over here is gone. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have um, brand new coins that, that were just given to you. And then anything you do is completely separate from, mm -hmm. from that. And, and now with regard to usernames, um, would I give you like a different username if I wanted you to pay my public account versus my private account? I was thinking of just using something like the um, like a period. So it would be like amanda.private or amanda.public. Got it, okay. Or um, like, so you, you could like name the accounts essentially and pay to, to like a sub account. Okay. And so it, like it would make it really easy for, for me to send money to you or maybe like there's amanda.default and you pick whether that's your private or your public and it would go into that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, we're, we're just kind of exploring ideas, but that, that's the general gist that I think I'm going for. Okay. All right, please continue. Uh, you were just getting into the savings account being the gateway into one's saved funds being put into masternode shares. Yeah, so with the, the, the Masternode share program, um, right now the Masternodes make about 8% a year. And, you know, that's, that's pretty good for an investment. Um, and then over time, um, what we, what we want to do is to uh, also, like, remove the, the absolute requirement to run one of these servers from the collateralization of this cryptographic bond instrument, which is essentially what the master node is, right? You have a cryptographic bond and then you have, uh, you have a 
a server that's associated with it. And mm -hmm. those two have to be both active on the network, right. unspent and um, pingable, you know, a real server. And you're not so you, much saying that you want to remove the collateral from from the master node, but rather you want to make it possible for someone who doesn't have a thousand to participate. Yeah, it, exactly. And to yeah. do that, you have to um, decouple the requirement for 1000 dash to belong exactly to one server. Mm -hmm. And so the the concept that, that, that is the, the one that we're thinking about implementing for this is where you have a pool of money and so like let's say you have um a thousand dollars in your savings account so that that can get you one ninth of a master node essentially because they cost nine thousand dollars right now um in what would it would do is you would get um something like 80 master node shares and then you know so it's 80 of a and, and that, that would get you one ninth of a full master node. Mm -hmm. And then you have these other people over here and they run the hardware. So like node 40 might be interested in participating in this. They could actually launch servers and claim some of those master node shares. Mm -hmm. And so in, in bulk, they claim like a thousand of the shares. And then you have all of those, those people with the money collateralizing this virtual server now over here being ran by these other people. Mm -hmm. And so that and I, that's, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, that's, that's essentially how it scales up. We get two giant pools, one of all of the servers, the virtually being ran for all of this collateral sitting in pool A from, you know, could be a 10,000, 100,000 investors even. Mm -hmm. I had a question from an audience member um, at my Minneapolis presentation recently, and um, I told him that I was going to be talking to you soon and that I would ask you, and this is the perfect time for me to ask you, but he basically wondered, um, would, would the collateral, would the shares need to be uh, like agreed to be locked for a certain amount of time to prevent, like, like if someone takes those funds out of their savings account, and that master node is now like, is it now missing some of its collateral, and so it goes offline, or are is it immediately uh, made whole again with with shares from elsewhere, or how how can that work? Yeah, so I was thinking like a combination of both of those. Um, since master nodes would belong to many different investors of, of different sizes, allocations of shares, you could have like 50 of a thousand shares go offline, right? Mm -hmm. And now, now you're uncollateralized like 5% of the node. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think that that's an issue like enough to jeopardize the master node in general, but then we could have thresholds. So like let's say it required 70% of the shares to be online at any given point for the master node to be active. And so you could have turnover, um, investors coming and going all of the time. And the system would then try to replace that as soon as possible. And it could prioritize like which ones it was going after to replace based off of how long the shares were missing or things like that. Hmm. So it could be a pretty intelligent system. And so then if some if a if a master node were say like 70% collateralized like it were in flux would it then receive like 70% of its normal payout or would it receive like all of its normal payout and the people left in the less than fully collateralized collateralized node would be like getting paid more than usual I'm just wondering about like the incentives that that could create Oh yeah there's there's some crazy incentives in there um, if if you set it up the the way that you're describing, um, you could actually try to take offline other people's money so that you get paid more. But yeah, <laughs> or just like, some of your own shares. <laughs> yeah, um, I I would say like it it would probably be proportionate to how many shares were active. So mm -hmm. one share would make you know one share's worth no matter how how much of the master node it was responsible for at that time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, there's there's weird stuff that could start happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I guess I'll, I'll get back into what I was talking about before. 
please. Yeah, that, that pretty much covers the account part of it. Like, I, I think that's a pretty simple way of showing it to users. Everyone can understand that. And it covers anonymity, the need for um, a public ledger as well, uh, which which is important. We could talk about that as as well, if you like. Sure. Because um, a, a lot of times when, when you're doing business online, like uh, it needs to be public, especially when it's like two businesses and they're just interchanging money. They don't want any privacy in that probably. And would you mind giving me like an example? Like let's say um, it's somebody in your supply line and and you you manufacture shirts or something. And so you're, you're buying the cotton from these guys over here and you send them money, but like in in that in that case you you want like this the transparent history but between the two of you in in a way that isn't obscured by by things like mixing okay so um, then does that mean if i were to receive a payment from somebody's private account that i my wallet would not show me that it came from like evan.private i just would not know who it came from is that is that what i'm hearing then no, no. So um, if, if you receive money even from somebody privately, um, you also receive direct communication from them saying that, hey, this, this money was for this and here's like the memo associated with it. And then that, that's how your wallet knows like which merchant it was and like what, what part like or what moderation queue it's in. And, and, and all of the processes on the network, they, they all go th through that communication system. And so you definitely know who's sending you money and whatnot. But then there's the, the public side of, of the ledger where it's recorded in the blockchain. And that's more of what I'm referring to. If you don't have all of this private information that the client will share, you could still associate um, those two people and, and know that, you know, I, I was... Uh, getting my cotton from this specific provider and I would get it on these specific days and it was for these specific amounts and you could track my business and figure out how it was growing or or you know Got how it. much I was paying for things things like okay. that right so like if I wanted to be able to prove to somebody that Evan sent me money uh, I w if you sent it to me privately, I would only be able to prove it to like really myself because just like my client would show me that yes the payment came from you but if I want to be able to prove it to anybody and everybody that you sent me money, then I would want to have it done publicly so that I could just like send the link on like a block explorer, for example, to anybody. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, another example would be like um, if we had a Coinbase type competitor in, in our space and um, they, they want probably um, to have some relationships with some other businesses where um, also, the, the clients are known because, you know, this is an a, um, AML compliant company, right? And so there's regulation. Everything internally then, uh, according to the, the regulations, just has to be completely transparent. They, they can't have, you know, uh, mixers, um, uh, you know, obscuring the, the blockchain and everything. Because then if the regulators come in and ask for information, they can't get, like, cut off there. And so, you know, the system would allow people to operate like that in our ecosystem, which I think is important just because it's, it's out of necessity sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So the, I guess the, the next thing was the marketplace. I think this so is, is probably it being the, called a marketplace. Is it, I've seen some comments about this online. I mean, so should it be called a marketplace, an app store, a merchant app store? Can only merchants live there? I'm sure you'll tell me. <laughs> you know, um, we, I think we've thrown around three or four names for it so far. And it's because like the concept has been growing. Uh, we, we started out with it as like this, like little type of like programmatic app store thing. And I, I think it's turned into something bigger than that. Like we want everyone that's in our ecosystem to be accessible through this one platform and for you to be able to like search through it and like search by ratings or search by the things they provide and the things they offer and um, and like have have some have some repository of information about what's available in the Dash ecosystem in a place that's available to everyone. So we can kind of all figure out like what we want to live there and what we don't want to live there. Okay. 
Um, and so like with with the the slides, um, all of the all of these these examples, they're actually our real partners. Um, so we have a VPN provider that that we have um, online. Um, right. Uh, Proton Mail integration that's that's happening now. Shake Note Forty. What we want to do is then after evolution's working, and you could literally drop in that like little snippet of of text. We're going to get an integration team up and running and start going out to these businesses and just show them the SDK, teach them how, how to install it and get set and up. SDK and SDK is something developer kit. What is SDK? Yeah. Software development kit. Software development kit. And so is that, I mean, in layman's terms, is that just saying like, hey, store, here's the code, here's the simple code that you would need to run in order to find yourself appearing in our marketplace? Yeah, well, it, it can actually do anything. So it would be the full API into our platform. Right, so okay. if if you were um, like if, if you're a, a merchant and we, we want to integrate with you and right now you take credit cards, PayPal, and you could add, you know, Dash just as easily as you added the other two. And I guess that's kind of the idea. We're going to go out and try to get all of the people that went for PayPal and make some kind of like integration process that they're already familiar with and just get them on board and get them into the marketplace so that um, people can find them. And then that, that should create that snowball effect where mm -hmm. we start onboarding lots of people because um, as a business platform, it should actually work. It should facilitate um, direct business between uh, these, these vendors and people without a third party in the middle. So it, I, I think it, it should be like pretty interesting to start seeing it actually see, see the gears turning, I guess. And now would that um, be just as easy for them to plug into like their in-person point of sale as it would be like their web presence? So with in-person point of sale, like that, that's a completely different um, concept of how, how we're going to deal with it. We want to make like physical hardware for, for like uh, merchants to, to integrate with us. Oh, what, like a little tablet or something? Yeah, something, something like that. Um, I, I looked at like a few of, of, the, the different platforms that are out there and some of them run on iPad, for example, and you just install the software and you're, you're oh, good to go. Nice. And then you yeah, click the nice. iPad into like this plastic thing and it, it can like flip around and, and then there's like a pen for signing and whatnot. Um, so, I mean, if we did something, I, th I think it would be along those lines. Cause yeah, I mean, just gets getting like the, the plastic created for, for the, the iPad to, to set in is really easy and, Making iPad software also is probably pretty cheap, so we could we could probably get into that space as well. And then would that just be contingent that, on being accepted into the iOS App Store? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, we're actually working on that, and we we think we have progress. So um, I I won't say anything yet, but okay. I'm I'm um, confidently excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. It confidently excited you heard yes. <laughs> it here on dash details everybody <laughs> all right please continue um okay so with with the marketplace it's this um concept of having an inclusive inclusive index of all that's available within dash and then hosting that via the the dappy api and then the the sdk is just for accessing all of that information and um, allowing people like an easy way of getting onboarded. And then I think the, the other portion of how we, how we are going to make this work is we use the, the funding process from the governance system to then fund an integration team to go out and, and start, um, you know, just uh, rolling these, these people through this process of onboarding and we'll get that down to a science. And, and then that's how we, that's how we grow the whole thing. Hmm. Just systematically. Yeah. So I mean, like, like in person, like on the ground, like integration teams. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Pete told me that he looked a lot into Uber's um, like early days, and he, he he told me that it seemed like their their immense success that they experienced 
was almost directly attributable to like what you're talking about. Like apparently Uber didn't launch anywhere unless there was a specific like integration launch team of real people on the ground in that particular city to facilitate the launch. That's really interesting. It makes sense. I, I mean, you do need boots on the ground. And I mean, Bitcoin's no different. They're, they, they really do need um, people to do integrations. They, they need like an administrative team and they, they've kind of got it figured out doing um, it completely with philanthropy. But I think as far as scaling, like I, I don't see that scaling very well. And so we're just systematically making our, our own system for, for doing it and funding it from, from the blockchain. So, you know, it, it's kind of exciting. Like we're, we're finally getting to the, the place where I, I think this is the next phase as, as the project goes into it's like some sort of, of meaningful maturity, it seems like. And Righteous. so, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, that's, that's pretty much all I had though for, for the, the app and the slides. That's kind of what I was telling people in, in Argentina about it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I did have one follow-up question um, in terms of, okay, so like I, I, I would have an address that's like amanda.public and like amanda.private. And certainly I know what that means because I know how Dash works. And so I was just wondering um, with, the, with Evolution's focus being a person who knows nothing about cryptocurrency, do you think, I mean, how, how is the wallet going to communicate to them if at all like what it means to have a public address and private address. Like, is there going to be like a little FAQ up in the wallet? That's like, what does it mean if I send a public payment versus private? I mean, is it going to be like, dear customer, there are these things called blockchains and they record all of your transactions. And like, how is that going to be approached for a person to know just what exactly this whole public and private thing means? Okay. So there's, there's a tipping point when technologies, they, they, they creep up really slowly. And then there's this point at which the average person eventually gets onboarded. And that's really far into the process of adopting a new technology, especially something that's, you know, what, five years old or, or, or no, 2008. So yeah, we're, we're going on a few years that, that we've been, that we've been um, exposed to this new technology, but I still think that as far as, as reaching that tipping point, and that, that's the point where everyone probably will um, be ready enough to really jump onto the, the bandwagon. We're, we're like really close toward the, the beginning. And so I, I would say like the first step is we need a scalable technology. The second step is we need something that looks like the legacy technologies people are used to dealing with. And then the third step is we need to onboard 1% of the population. They could be the smartest of, of all of them. Like these, these are probably the, the, the people that got smartphones first, right? Okay. Previously. And then you get them on board and then we go for the next 10% or the next 15%. Um, and so like, I, I would see it as creating like a series of wallets and all of these wallets, they all use the same API, right? Because we decoupled the GUI from the backend. And so the first one, we, we could create FAQs and, and different things to educate the people that, that are getting onboarded, just, just like what you described and, and get them up to speed. The, second and third and fourth iteration i think is so far away from that that all of the complexity should just be gone we should not even be caring about the blockchain anymore because we have you know 10 percent of the population on it and there's mm -hmm. probably a lot of privacy that's been built in by that that time and you know it probably removes a lot of the the risk of being um of, of utilizing this type of technology right that's kind of how I see it going. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I have, I think, one or two questions for you. The first would be, 
I think I had a little thought like brewing in the back of my mind the other day and then Pete surprised me when he articulated it and I wanted to see um, whether you like agree or disagree with it and what you think about it basically but he said something like you know I wonder if like when evolution comes out like our first users and the majority of our users like basically will not be any of the people who are in the crypto sphere now, like any of the 99% of capital in the crypto sphere now that owns coins other than Dash. And he said, like, basically, I think it'll just be people who have not been hanging around the crypto sphere all these years who pick up evolution, but just totally brand new people who were otherwise uninterested in blockchain magic. And so, like, what do you think about that? Like, because it seems to me and I might make a video about this in the coming weeks, um, but that like Dash is like treated like a redheaded stepchild, but it's really like becoming like, like the Goliath of the crypto sphere. And it's very interesting to watch all this play out. And so do you think it will continue that way even after evolution? Like, are there so many egos on the line? I mean, what do you think? Okay. So, I, I, I would start by saying um, the whole ecosystem as a whole is worth $13 billion, right? Right. If you, if you add up every one of these projects, um, if you take all of the derivatives into account of the, the world economy and you add it all up and you stack it up, we're talking a hundred trillion, right? And decentralized technology is better than centralized technology. I mean, that is a fact. And so what will happen eventually is that 100 trillion is going to flow into the decentralized markets. And so we have from 13 trillion to 100 trillion to go, you know? And so um, I, I see it as being that all of that other money that's out there, it's, it's, attached to things that, you know, they aren't providing good return. Um, the, the banks, for example, like what they pay like 2% or 0.2% uh, More like the latter. Yeah. Yeah. If they pay uh, anything at all. Yeah. And so you have that and stocks haven't been returning that great of returns over the last while. Um, bonds are more dangerous than they've ever been with the amount of debt countries hold. Um, and so there's, there's three, three areas where um, I, I see there being possible like huge declines in, in those, those economies and that money coming over to us. But first we need like this first series of companies, decentralized companies to work and to expand the market up into the point where you know, it's worth a hundred billion dollars or five hundred billion dollars, but all of that money comes from new people. It's it's the people that were invested in in those things I had mentioned that will figure out like slowly and surely, um, and start earning way more than the other people, and then bragging about it, and then that's just gonna keep it happening. But you know, like how long does that take? Like I have no idea. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It causes me to wonder. I mean, like some of these folks who claim that they own various cryptos and, you know, all the while they're calling me a shill and you a scammer. Like, are they going to have to, like, get drunk to, like, mask their tears while, like, they open their first evolution wallet because it it would just be crazy not to. It seems like way too beneficial for them not to. Or are they just going to, like, never open an evolution wallet and, like, become grumpy old men who are like that shill and that scammer? they they got unfair advantage or something and they'll like be saying that to their grave it makes me wonder yeah the cognitive dissonance that that will cause <laughs> yeah i have no idea <laughs> yeah all right and final question would be um would you mind sharing what did you do before you started dash and like began working full-time for dash like what was your job because as i've mentioned before to various people um, in my estimation, the the occurrence of, of of programmers who also understand economics, or vice versa, someone who understands economics who can also program, like that person is so 
rare it's 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 not even surprising like the the economic absurdities we see in so many of these other chains that like can't figure out why does our node count keep dropping why does our infrastructure keep centralizing and they just cannot figure it out so you're one of those unicorns you can program and you also understand economic incentives what did you do before you were doing cryptocurrency okay so i started programming when i was 15. Um, and I started with Visual Basic 6, which is actually a pretty awesome language to learn on. It's like really crazy, slow and stupid built by Microsoft, but it's like this GUI thing where you can design like programs within it. So like building calculators and stuff. And then I got an internship and I worked for this crazy German guy, which I mean, that, that was a lot of fun. He was trying to like take over Tempe um, Arizona as like the ISP against Cox and he got me introduced to Perl and then from that we, we were like building these systems for um, uh, like managing customers and and then from there I started building um, call center technology for uh, managing like automating queues and I, I'd like Speaking mathematical yeah <laughs> sorry about that background noise yeah. right um, on cue so I, I worked for like a couple ISPs and that, that was interesting. I, I then like switched over to working for SEO companies. I, I, was, I, I was a black hat guy for a little while Ooh. and was like hacking different things on the internet, probably illegally. <laughs> wow. And, and then um, I switched to like white hat SEO. And we were um, modeling the, the the public part of the internet and trying to figure out how the rankings worked. And so I, I modeled our algorithm after Google's and was trying to work out how theirs worked. So I was using machine learning and stuff for, for doing that. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for the government for a while um, with clearance, uh, hacking again. <laughs> um, really? I, I've hacked for a few different companies professionally. Uh, yeah, like security work has been something I've, I've done a lot of. Um, and then uh, more recently, um, I, as like a hobby while I was doing a job, I got my Series 65 and started doing machine learning um, technology for modeling signals for the stock market. And I was What's selling What's Series those. 65? Uh, so there's like a, a few of these different licenses that are required to get into the financial services industry in the US. The Series 65 allows you to run um, investment firms. So I, I like pass that, which it's a really hard test to pass. The, the book was like that thick and the test was like four hours or something, it's crazy. Mm. Um, I studied like nonstop for like three months to do it. And that, that's where I like, um, I, I studied economics for like five years before that in my spare time, just because I was interested in it. And then I did that and I like learned the rest of it. And then I, I passed the test. A lot of it was about economics and, and whatnot. And then, then I started um, doing these models for the stock market. And um, I was doing like breeding of, of these different models together and, and then like um, retesting the children and, I had like farms of computers running, doing it. It was a lot of fun. Um, I had a few hundred people that were subscribed. And then after that, I, I saw Bitcoin and got into that. Um, with all of the economic knowledge and, and different things that I'd done, like it, it was like perfect fit. Cause I've, I've done a lot of security work. I've done a lot of economic work. I've done a lot of machine learning work, which I think is gonna be really useful for the next part. And um, and so when I started messing around with the Bitcoin client, I was kind of surprised that nobody was interested in in tweaking the things I was interested in, and none of them were like thinking about the problems the same way. And so I started asking questions around random people, and um, everyone was like, "Yeah, those." sound like really good ideas you should probably do something and so then i started like hacking on the client and and that's where um x11 came from and 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 all of that and then it kind of just it like blew up like um 
pretty quickly at at my my job like within two weeks of of dash starting um i couldn't focus on work anymore and then i kind of got fired slash quit <laughs> huh, I, I know how that goes <laughs> I was like literally working on this like all of the time. And even while I was at work, I was thinking about it and I was like checking the forums and stuff. And my boss would like come over. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so he got like really mad at me and we still talk, but um, that, that kind of, um, that, that was the parting of, of ways there. Uh, and then I've been full-time since then. Um, haven't looked back. I see. Well, sounds like the groundwork was certainly laid. And it's just occurred to me now, rather it is not lost on me that I have referred to Dash as cryptocurrency's redheaded stepchild more than once <laughs> in the past. And you are in fact redheaded and it is all coming together quite nicely, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> all right. There's Very actually good. a bunch of redheads. Um, you know, Holger is a redhead too, our QA guy. That's right, he is. Probably the more um, redheads we can get on board, the better, I would say. Yeah, Ira yeah. Miller, it's, yeah. yeah, like um, I'm, I'm just attracting them from all around the world and, and trying to get them in one group. Yeah. You know, I, I think well, it's I mean, I, power somehow. <laughs> and I've heard that redheads are also like a dying breed or whatever. So maybe, I don't know, yeah. there's some special, something special in the genetics. I would, I would say keep that going. I'm, I'm bullish on redheads. Let's They're going that. extinct. It's, it is a problem. <laughs> Yeah. Very um, good. The the other one one more thing before we go that I want to talk about was um twelve dot one. Um oh yes, please. Okay, so as like just a really short status update, uh I I redid my development environment. Um basically like what, what happened, which was kind of interesting, is at, I um I decentralized our, our development team. Um we got a new guy named Tim. Um we like re-coordinated how we do everything. And then they essentially took over after I wrote all of the prototype code for how 12.1 works with Sentinel and with the governance system and everything. And then um, just like a, a couple weeks ago, like it's looking like it's pretty stable. Um, and so I, I started up 25 uh, masternodes on a test server and I've been like issuing the, the commands to create super blocks, which appears to also be working correctly now. Um, mm -hmm. And the network seems stable. Everything looks like um, we're pretty good to go. There's two other things that I need to test before we launch. Um, one is pooled mining, and there's um, a couple of security things I need to look into. But um, I would say definitely by December 14th, we will be um, on 12.1 uh, on mainnet. Shortly after recording, Holger Schenzel, who spearheads quality assurance, automation, and testing for Dash, noted that a release date of January 1st, 2017 would be realistic. All right. Well, that pretty much does it for us. So thanks for your time, Evan. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. That's it for this week's Dash Detailed. If you want to talk about anything you heard in the show today or anything Dash related at all, I invite you to join us in one of our many social channels. You can find them listed at the link you see in the card on your video screen right now. In addition to that, be sure to follow us on Twitter for oh-so-important updates, and I'll see you next Wednesday.